Hello everybody, welcome along. My name is Benjamin Bloom. This is the Benjamin Bloom Football Channel. Please leave your bias at the door. This is the Championship Game Week review for round eight. We're in midweek, so this is part two. It's the only way I can keep up, so I apologise. There would literally be no time to do 12 games in between now and the next game week which obviously starts tomorrow, doesn't it? So we're going to go over the Wednesday night games. It's Thursday now. They happened last night. We've already done all of the Tuesday night ones. So check them out elsewhere on the channel. And as I've been trying to keep up with, I will clip the games individually if you're only interested in hearing about your team. But here at the Benjamin Bloom Football Channel, we would love you to take an interest in all the teams in the championship, um, that is the type of subscriber we're up for. Open-minded, wanting to learn about other teams than just their own. Uh, this show is brought to you in association with a fan sponsor, Russ Peak, a fan and now a friend, despite Ben's terrible taste in football teams. There is Russ, resplendent in his Norwich City shirt. There you go. And we have a commercial sponsor as well uh, for this couple of weeks. www.fanfirst.co.uk User-generated rating site. I'm sure you've seen in the newspaper the um, ratings out of 10. Everyone loves to have a look. Agree, disagree. Well, go ahead and do it yourself now because you can go into FanFirst, register your email and which team you support. And then go and get rating and you can be the one giving the ratings. I did so last night after my watch along. Uh, so you can see me do that on that other video uh, for Luton versus Forest. But you can go in and rate the players, rate the managers, rate the entertainment, rate the referee, even rate the VAR up in the Premier League games. So do um, check out FanFirst, uh, fanfirst.co.uk. And thank you also to Russ, our sponsors for this show. Here are our results from last night. So six games per night on Tuesday and Wednesday. More even split with seven and five last week. And it was Preston nil, Millwall two. That was a 7 p.m. The rest of them 7.45s. Birmingham two, Huddersfield one, Luton one, Forest one, Bournemouth one, Bristol City nil, Rotherham three, Sheffield Wednesday nil, Derby one, Cardiff one were our results from last night. Our first port of call then will be Bournemouth one, Bristol City nil. A pretty big game in the context of this season thus far. Bournemouth, obviously relegated Premier League parachute team, started really well under Jason Tindall and Bristol City. Also, unproven manager in Dean Holden also started really well. But some injuries creeping in for the Robins. It was Bournemouth 1, Bristol City 0. So the Cherries get the win and stay undefeated. But let's just talk about those Bristol City injuries because I spoke to a number of worried Bristol City fans yesterday. Alfie Mawson and Stephen Sessigny on the two guys on loan from Fulham. Um, out and being operated on, I think, both of them, and Andy Vyman as well. Um, you would think definitely two of those three in Mawson and Vyman would have been heavy on appearances this season with Sessignon, maybe uh, less so. However, bad, bad news for Bristol City there in terms of those injuries coming in. So we'll look at their team first. Viner, Callis, Moore in front of Bentley. Bakinson comes back in. Um, he... Is he going to be the next expensive player off the grid at Bristol City? He's having a great season, isn't he? So Patterson, O'Dowd are obviously starting then in the absence now of Vyman and probably will continue to do so. Rowe and Hunt. Uh, Jeju and Semenyu up front. No Wells, no Martin. So a confident bit of rotation there from Dean Holden. Wells and Martin have been really good this season, haven't they? Um, for Bournemouth, the normal system... Um, I'm trying to remember. I don't think that's too much rotation from the game we did against Watford. Begovic in goal. Kelly, Cook, Mepham, Smith and Stacey. So um, I'm pretty sure Rico started ahead of Smith. 
I think I'm right in saying that. And Gosling didn't start in the last game. Neither did Stanislaus, who plays off King and Solanke. Uh, and just this sense this season, particularly, that um, I don't know whether it's COVID or a depressed market or what have you, that the um, parachute teams just have such powerful squads, don't they? Um, here is the goal. Uh, you can see lovely little first-time ball through by Dom Solanke. There is Dan Juma, driven wide. Bentley doesn't do a lot wrong. He's made himself nice and big, closed it down. But Dan Juma's quality, isn't he? And dinks it up and over the Bristol City keeper. And into Ua, the back of the net for the win for Bournemouth, who, like I say, stay undefeated. Uh, there are the numbers. You can see the goal coming late in the game, 81 minutes. And... I've watched a highlights package of this for those people who like to start their comments. You missed out. Um, remember, guys, I'm covering 30 teams this season, so um, I can't put every detail of every game into these reviews. But I'll try and get the main stuff. Uh, so 12 shots to 8, 55 on the possession for uh, Bournemouth there. Five corners to four, intimates some extra territory. But on the chances, tight. Look, two big chances to one, one big chance each missed. I think this was a bit of a ding-dong battle. Um, certainly, Jeju had a big chance and Semenyo had a big chance. Would Wells or Martin have put those um, big chances away? Um, sorry, I'm using the term big chance advisedly. I don't mean that. I mean a, a decent chance. It didn't come up as a big chance um, in terms of sofa scores. Wording there. But uh, Bournemouth managing to do the job again. And um, they're not losing, are they, Bournemouth? So in tight games, I mean, we talked about Reading just nailing tight games this season, already have seven wins. But Bournemouth are solid under Tyndall. They're not losing, they're undefeated. Um, in tight games, they're doing well. There's a number of draws in there. But when we look at the league table, uh, your classic way of getting two points per game is win one, draw one, win one, draw And that's exactly what Bournemouth have done. So that draw streak ended... And they go on to 16 points from eight, which I always say two points per game at any point in the season you should take. You really, really should. And Bournemouth move into second place. And if not for this mental start by Reading, um, who are miles ahead of everybody, aren't they? Six points clear now. Bournemouth have closed the gap a little bit. But if you're Bournemouth, lots of signs of sustainability for the Cherries. Uh, the succession from How to Tyndall has looked good, has proved me wrong, to be honest. I, I worried about Bournemouth managing to cope with that. I've, I've been totally wrong about that so far. It's been nice and calm. Not too many players going out. Obviously, Ake and Ramsdale and Wilson went fairly early, but still. Look, Begovic for Ramsdale, fine for the championship. Um, Ake, well, they're playing Cook and Mepham and... Kelly and Rico's gone in there fine for the championship. And up top, uh, in terms of Wilson, well, they've still got Solanke, Surridge, King, Danjuma. So the players going out haven't meant that Bournemouth can't be competitive and put out not even a first 11, but a championship 16 that should just be absolutely fine in this league if um, they're playing well. And, and they are. So well done to Bournemouth. Bit worrying for Bristol City uh, after you can see there the last four games, two points in four, and they'd won the first four straight games under Dean Holden. So, two worrying facets here. One is the trend in results is downward, and two, just those players now, Vyman, very much so, because he'd pretty much been um, in the team all the time. Sessignon less so, but Mawson, I was really excited to see a, a back three there with Mawson and Thomas Callas in as well. They're not going to be able to do that. So that is disappointing. And for the second season running, do you remember last season, a phobie as well. They went for a loan. Presumably they paid a loan fee and were paying a nice proportion of a phobie's wages. And he was injured early in the season. So um, a bit bad luck there for Bristol City and trending downwards. What I would say, though, is where the downward trend levels out, I don't know. Does it level out at fourth place, where they um, 
uh, sorry, sixth place where they are currently, excuse me, or lower than that and outside the playoffs. Um, we will find out. Bournemouth 1, Bristol City 0. Next up is Preston 0, Millwall 2. Good result for Millwall there. I see a lot of similarities between um, these two clubs. Both punch above their weight. Both have been in League 1. Both recruit very well to build championship teams and compete against those horrible parachute payments that distort everything. Let's not go off on that rant today. But look, now you've got really players that have gone for high fees in the championship, like Ryan Woods, Ken Zahor in that team with um, the stayed stars who we thought might have gone in Cooper and Wallace. Bialkowski's got championship experience. So has Malone trying to polish a rough diamond like Mason Bennett. If all of that works, going to be a good season for Millwall and it's going well thus far. Preston, the name on everyone's lips there has been Emil Rees, who's playing up top for them now. And it seemed like a gap Preston fans wanted to be filled. Otherwise, familiar names, Luke Johnson and Sinclair with quality there. Potts, uh, Ledson and Brown in the double pivot there and a pretty solid looking back five. Let's have a look at the goals here. And I want to play this one all out because this is excellent from uh, Bennett. Look where he receives the ball. He's going to chest that down and fool the closing uh, Preston player there. He's going to spin round, run, and this is so direct and so good. Feed it through to Jed Wallace into the box. Nicely weighted ball um, there. Uh, Wallace, ever the decisive player, into the box, squares it for Zahor. And that's just perfect Millwall under... Gary Rower, um, okay without the ball, good at defending, but when given the opportunity to transition quickly with people like Wallace and Bennett, and now have they got their focal point quality championship attacker that maybe they have been looking for since the partnership of Steve Morrison and Lee Gregory was sort of broken up by age and one of them leaving. 1-0 uh, there. And the second goal, is that Barkhazen? Someone will correct me in the comments there. Um, a foul anyway on Murray Wallace. He's just going to swipe at the ball. And wrong place, wrong time. And Jed Wallace smacks in the penalty there for 2-0. And a good away win for Mill Wall indeed. Um, there in the numbers, as we'd expect as ever, Gary Rout teams don't need possession to um, put up good numbers. And they do look two big chances to one, uh, the one big chance missed, but a two-goal victory there. 13 shots to five, four shots on target to one. Uh, looks like a very decent worker day, Gary Rowett, Millwall performance. And look at that, Millwall fans. 10 points in the last four games. Lovely stuff there. And third in the table, one defeat, 15 points from eight is one off the fabled uh, 16, uh, as in the fabled two points per game, is what I am getting at there. So 15 points from eight is one off the fabled two points per game. Excellent, excellent start from Millwall. And just that one defeat in there so far. I think that, where was that? Was that Swansea? I'm trying to recall. I think it was. Um, but yeah, look, looking good. We said this about Millwall. Can they ride the momentum they've had basically since Rauer entered the club and pull it through into this season? Obviously, it helps retaining Woods on another loan. It helps not selling either Cooper or Wallace. And hmm, who knows where this could go for the Lions. Preston uh, would want to swap places with Millwall. Um, they have similar aspirations, don't they? But... Uh, not quite doing as good a job there. Five points behind. But they can win games in the championship. Obviously, that big 4-2 win at Brentford will give them um, cause for some optimism. But already four defeats. And I believe I'm right in saying, and we checked this during the game last night, I believe that Preston are the best team in the league at home. and uh, Away, excuse me. And the worst team in the league at home. I've double-checked that. But... Um, I believe that to be the case. And I don't think they even scored a goal at home. So uh, really weird um, disparity between home and away performances for Preston. Preston nil, Mill will do. I'm sure some of you were with me last night for the live watch along, which was 
Luton 1, Forest 1, down at Kenilworth Road. Uh, interesting game narrative-wise with a, a red card and a bit of a 10-man comeback from uh, Forest. Luton sticking with their three at the back there with Bradley Pearson and Lockyer. Dewsbury Hall starts with Glenn Ray and James Collins returns. Uh, in terms of Forest, a little tweak there. They did play Taylor and Graben up top, but a 4-2-3-1 here with Knockart, Lolly and Amiobi. Um, interested to see Chris Hewton's loose use even of Joe Lolly as a number 10. That was tried by Lamucci a couple of times, but certainly a very dangerous player, Lolly. And a bit of quality there with Lolly and Knockart now. Um, and believe me, Knockart already looks like he's got more license at Forest than he ever had at Fulham, let's just say. Certainly links up with Hewton better than he did with Scott Parker. There is the opening goal. Uh, ball goes loose from a corner. Ray spins on it. It's a good finish, actually, because look, uh, he's plenty of pressure on him. He's got one place he can put it. And God, look where he puts it, right into the corner there. Glenn Ray giving Luton the lead 1-0. And then here we go again. So this is Nicolas Iannou going into a challenge with Martin Craney. Obviously, again, for those people that ridiculously like to complain about this, I don't have the rights to show the clips on here. We can only do uh, stills. So I will explain. Iannou goes in for the challenge. He wants to prod the ball away from Craney. He gets there a millisecond too late, but his, the bottom of his foot, of the studs, uh, which are not quoted in the laws, by the way, hits the top of the ball and then rolls over the top of the ball. And then Craney makes the challenge. Neither of them, uh, then the ball sort of goes loose. And Iannou makes contact then with Craney in a way that's obviously not desirable. As usual, we refer to the wording of the laws rather than say any silly things like studs up, um, uh, things of that nature that literally people quote that aren't in the laws or over the top of the ball, etc. They're literally not in the laws, guys. Don't quote them when you're talking about red cards. Um, a tackle or challenge that endangers the safety of an opponent or uses excessive force or brutality must be sanctioned as serious foul play. Any player who lunges an opponent in challenging from the ball from the front from the side or from behind using one of both legs with excessive force or endangers the safety of an opponent. It's guilty of serious foul play. So look, we're here again. Uh, feel free to say whether you think it was a red card or not in the comments. But as usual, I'll say with this, with tackles like this, you're just not going to win or lose the debate on this one. The wording is so open that most bad tackles and fouls, if you wanted to, you could argue were red cards and you could argue that we're not. I mean, does does he lunge? Well, yes. Um, does it endanger the safety of the opponent? Maybe. <laughs> Every tackle endangers the safety of the opponent. Uh, brutality, maybe not. Excessive force? What is excessive force? So, look, we've seen them given, we've seen them not, but um, feel free to debate it in the comments. What did happen is Iannou was sent off and that meant Forrest had to play the second half with 10 men. But they do get back into the game. Um, sadly, I don't appear to have the goal there. It was an own goal by Glenn Ray. Christie crossing the ball in from the right. Yates making a good central midfield run into the box and Ray heads it in. Hopefully I've done that justice. Describing it and credit to Forrest really if we look at the numbers there. Given the 10 men, um, a really, really good result. Um, they didn't rally for long, but they scored when they rallied. And they played with intensity. They they didn't just sit there and, and hope to catch something. They did press and they did try and advance fullbacks. And as you can see for the goal, get support up for uh, Lyle Taylor, who was obviously just up on his own in a 4-4-1 formation in the second half. And look there... Um, a pretty competitive game, and especially given the 10 men. Obviously, if you're a Luton fan, you'll be really disappointed. You've got a one-goal lead at half-time, uh, 10 men. You've got to remember with Forrest, though, there's quality in that team. We're talking about Knockart and Lolly and Colback, Lyle Taylor and Lewis Graben to choose from, Bree Samba in goal. They were fifth for most of last season, let's let's be honest. It was only the mad collapse at, at, the, at the death there. 
So a lot of quality there and Hewton just, you know, really good at this level, isn't he? So although it's disappointing for a, from a Luton point of view, it shows where they are now with Nathan Jones in the first draw of the season for the Hatters. They are in ninth. They're good start from them, 13 from eight. That's very, very decent, isn't it? If they're around that points per game, then it's going to be a really productive season in the second quartile of the table. And maybe you can push for a playoff challenge. If you can, it looks like with Luton, they would need to put together one of these runs where, I don't know, you you win six and draw one out of um, eight or nine at some point during the season. So that would be my feeling on Luton. My feeling on Forrest is Chris hewton has gone there. He's got, uh, he's played four games. He's got six points from them. Obviously, they'd want more points. But look, immediately undefeated, good in management tweaks by a good manager. And the trend is clearly upwards. The wins need to come, however. But they'll take a 1-1 draw at Luton, given they had 10 men for most of the second, well, for all of the second half and a vast proportion of the game, let's just say. Um, Luton won, Forest won. Next up, as I predicted, a rather unhelpful draw between Derby and Cardiff. Both could have done with the win. Cardiff, um, hard to beat. Derby, finding it hard to win, if you if you will, with the analysis for both of them. Uh, the good news for Derby now is your front three with Lawrence Waghorn and Josviak now with We've reached that with eight games gone with injuries and um, Josviak uh, just being integrated into English football. So that's good news. Uh, Rooney still isolating, I guess. Shinny and Knight in central midfield. Buchanan Byrne. Clark Davis Wisdom. Roos looks like a settled Derby team now that is trending upwards. And again, where that trend leaves them, I don't know. But it was a horrible start. Looks more optimistic now. For Derby, uh, Cardiff, solid and stayed as ever. Bakuna there in the back four if Sofa score a right. Pack and Volks, double pivot. Ojo, Rules, Hoylett. So no Harry Wilson there, interestingly. Uh, Kiefer Moore up top. Glatzel has had minutes now, hasn't he? So um, a bit of an option there for Harris. Martin Waghorn's been back for two games. Uh, I'll, I'll, I say leave my bias at the door, but I did love Martin Waghorn. Uh, Ipswich and he scored two brilliant free kicks very um, his xg for both of these goals must have been incredibly low look at that it's going to go over the wall and stick it in the top corner there what are you going to do brilliant stuff from uh, Waghorn who set point set piece doyen at the moment one nil for Derby um, I want to show you all of this because this is similar to what we saw with um, Bennett at Millwall here's Ojo receives Drives forward, and look at that. He's going to pierce that defence there, playing between Wisdom and Davis. Kiefer Moore makes the run. They've let him go, and he sticks it home into the net for 1-1. One, one. As I say, Cardiff are hard to play against, hard to beat, aren't they? Uh, look at the big chances as well. Two for Cardiff, none for Derby. So it looks like in the main the main pattern of the game, Derby maybe had more of the ball, but in the penalty boxes, which we would expect from Neil Harris and from Cardiff, um, they might think that they could have got more from this game. And it's only a worldly free kick that they've conceded, isn't it? So maybe some cause for optimism for Cardiff there. And look at that, Cardiff with more passes than Derby. Who'd have thunk it? And the two big chances as well. And hit woodwork twice. So if I'm a Cardiff fan, looking at those numbers, I'm thinking... Maybe, and especially given the worldy free kick, maybe that could have been a three-pointer. But, as I say, an unhelpful draw for both. Um, Derby trending in the right direction, aren't they, after the horrible, horrible start. Rooney to come back as well, you'd think, into that central midfield. So maybe the upward trend improves and continues. Cardiff, well, drawing a lot of games if we bring up the table there, drawn half their games. And, I mean, you would say, look, a low number of goals relatively conceded, a low number of defeats. That's good, but obviously not enough wins. Although, looking at those last five, unbeaten there. Derby, yes, I mean, if you look at the last five, five points from five is kind of just avoiding relegation form. They need wins. They've got one win in eight. But, as I keep saying, I think some cause for optimism compared to 
all of those defeats, um, four or five in the first six, for, for sure, I think, uh, for Derby. Uh, Derby won, Cardiff won. It's a victory for Birmingham and a goal from open play, God damn it, and two goals in a game for Karanka. Uh, they beat Huddersfield 2-1 and um, did they actually drop the massively defensive back flat back five that we've seen the last few games? It looks like they did so. Uh, friend moving across the left back, Dean and Roberts and Colin there. Christian Pedersen on the bench. Interesting there. He's been a standout good player for Birmingham the past season and a bit, hasn't he? Uh, Sanchez and Bella on the wings and they've loaded up in the midfield there. Sunjic, San Jose and Gardner. So it looks like Karanka just moving his wall slightly forward rather from the centre-back position into centre-midfield position. Hogan uh, up top, but look on the bench. Jukovic there, Leko, Clayton, Pedersen. Mm, quite strong there in terms of um, the Birmingham bench. Huddersfield going with the three at the back here. Diakabi and Campbell starting up top for them. The excellent wing backs there, Toffolo and Pippa, have caught the eye this season. Uh, catching the eye in this game, though, um, are going to be uh, Jeremy Bella. And um, Gardner is going to score a really decent header. You can see Bella whips the free kick in from the right. And look at that for a climb. He's quite a way out from goal. Look where he puts it as well. Great headed goal and set play. Uh, Bella is a very useful championship player. That's one of the best bit of businesses, best bits of business, excuse me, we've seen over the past couple of seasons. Free agent outside of the window last season. Uh, well done on, uh, it would have been Pep Clotets Birmingham there, wouldn't it? Picking him up. Uh, we saw a great free kick from Waghorn. Here's a really good one from Mbenza. It's quite close in. What I really like about this is um, he managed, it's not a floaty floaty one. He manages to shove that one in the corner very, very nicely. Good goal by Mbenza. But Jukovic is back. Where would Birmingham have been without him the past couple of seasons? So there's Mbenza's free kick flying in the corner there, much to Etheridge's despairing dive. Now, Leko into the box off the bench. He's going to smack that against the crossbar. It rebounds and on the volley, Jukovic is going to find that gap between the two uh, Huddersfield covering players there and stick it into the back of the net for the winner for Birmingham. So Birmingham score two goals. Birmingham get their first win uh, since the opening day. Birmingham don't play five at the back and Birmingham score from open play. Unbelievable scenes for Karanka there. There are the numbers, <laughs> 23% possession. I love the tactical diversity in this league and it's great having Karanka back, isn't it? Um, and if you think it's dull, go ahead and see if you can beat him. Not many people can score past him, can they? So um, there you go, 23% uh, possession, but 14 shots and two big chances to zero. What are you going to do, hey? What are you going to do? <laughs> 197 passes to 677. Birmingham get the win. And I'm sure we'll get a comment. Possession does not win your games. It doesn't. It just does not. Not um so not a Karankovis Corberon. There, these teams, um, it's a bit weird that locked on 10 points there when you would think um there was such optimism with uh Huddersfield. Didn't Huddersfield get 10 points from four games, three wins and a draw um in a row? But they've got the same amount of points as, as Birmingham and they're, they're on 15th and 16th. Um, I suspect from a Huddersfield point of view, 16th, 16th and upwards, they'd probably be happy with, wouldn't they, given um, the change in manager, the lack of spending and available money there, Carl and Grant going out. Birmingham, oof, they just want solid, stable season. But look at that. Only conceded five goals so far. Some miserly defences here, but look. Five goals conceded by Karanka, five from Warnock at Borough, four from Ivic and uh, Reading just doing crazy mental stuff at the top of the table. Just three conceded, but Ivic, Warnock and Karanka, they're going to be fun to score against this season, aren't they? So uh, both teams settling in on 10 points and probably both sets of fans would be happy for a nice trouble three season of improvement and looking for something to build on next season. That's where they are at the moment. I wonder if either can go higher. Birmingham 2, Huddersfield 1. And finally, a win for Rotherham. Not pegged back in the last minute. Rotherham 3, Sheffield Wednesday 0. Wednesday stay on minus 
four points. There's still no Luongo for Sheffield Wednesday. They go with Marriott and Patterson up top. Again, where's Izzy Brown gone? Um, we, we thought he might be a great help getting that minus 12 gone. He's disappeared again, hasn't he? Uh, Rotherham, nice and settled. Uh, Wood comes in next to Ihequa. Um, is Angus McDonald still suspended? I think he is. Uh, Matigan hard in the fullbacks. Lindsay, Barlassa and Wiles. Looks like quite a fun midfield, that for Rotherham, with Joseph Zoon and Miller flanking. Pretty impressive Ladapo this season, who's given a lot of teams some trouble. It's going to give uh, Sheffield Wednesday some trouble. His shot deflects. Up in the air. This is really good from Lindsay. First look at the climb. And then to cushion the header over the head of the keeper. Uh, decent goal that by Lindsay. 1-0 Rotherham. Uh, this was after a drone had interrupted the game. Don't know what was going on there. All the players going in. And a key moment here. Red card for Lees. And again, uh, that is Ladapo, isn't it? I think um, I can... Slightly obscured, let's just say. Uh, pulls him down. Penalty, red card, and you know then, 2-0, if they score the penalty, game over, prob probably obvious goal-scoring opportunity. And there's Barlassa, spot the ball there. It's slammed into the roof of the net for Rotherham for 2-0. Uh, and they go 3-0 up before half-time. The first shot is palmed out, and there is Lindsay's going to hit the rebound in. 3-0 Rotherham, and we were in contact with Rotherham fans during the watch-along, thinking, surely now, 3-0, can't throw this one away, 3-0 and 10 men, and they duly did not. Went on and got the win, nice and comfortable, really, for Rotherham in the end, Look, 15 shots, 8 corners to nil, 3 big chances to 1. Okay, there's the mitigating factor of the red card, they already had the lead, didn't they? So, look, well done, Rotherham. A lot of goodwill towards Rotherham from championship fans. A club that does not run at ridiculous losses. A club that will take a relegation and make a profit. Um, steady with their manager. Well-liked manager. Uh, got the right size stadium. They're just a good example. And against these evil uh, parachute teams, we, we tend to want uh, Rotherham uh, to try and say that this is not impossible for teams to run properly and challenge. And... They look more competitive this season, don't they, than in 18-19. There's not been many games I've thought, ah, oh, you know, just not good enough, Rotherham. Been competitive in, in all of that, other than the mad Reading 3-0 um, there. But hey, Reading would probably beat Bayern Munich at the moment, wouldn't they? Wednesday, eh, it's worrying. We said about Wednesday, and they started well, didn't they? I think it was eight points from the first five games. Doing really good. We said they need to get to zero points. Um, success is going to be delayed, whatever that is this season for Wednesday. Even if they play well, it's going to take a load of time to get to zero and then out of the relegation zone. And we worried about a losing run. And it's come already eight games into the season. That's three defeats in a row. And we said uh, deferring and delaying getting to zero points is going to be a big problem for Wednesday because we're saying they can go on a really good run and still not get out of the bottom three until later and later in the season. And if you're a Wednesday fan, you just want to see them out of there. You want the minus 12 done. You want to be out of the bottom three as soon as possible. And uh, runs like this are not going to help. And they stay on minus four points. Obviously, now you can see, well, Coventry is sliding down. But that gap now is nine points. So you're looking at nine points to bridge the gap. You're looking at one point per game for possible safety normally in the championship and landing at 46 by the end of the season. We know they need an extra 12. They need to build up 58 points essentially um, across the season. So um, it's now looking like, let's say, 50 points to go to reach 46 in uh, 38 games. Starts to become more and more difficult when you use the maths, doesn't it? So I think they need Luongo back. I think they need Izzy Brown back. Just need to get to zero. But Congratulations to Rotherham, though, who are up in 17th place. Only three defeats. Uh, they've already got two wins. It's all about those three-pointers for Rotherham. We know they're going to be competitive. They need to win tight games. They need to, when they do get a red card and a penalty, take advantage, take the three points. They did in this one. Rotherham, three. Sheffield, Wednesday, nil. So there we go. That is the midweek round. Uh, six games Tuesday, 
Six games on Wednesday. Thank you, everybody, for catching up. Hopefully, you'll get to see this before we do the review show, which will be live tonight at 7 p.m. Come and join us for that. Thank you once more to our fan sponsor, Russ Peak, a fan and now a friend, despite Ben's terrible taste in football teams. Russ sponsors all of our championship review show this season. And the whole channel is currently sponsored by www.fanfirst.co.uk. Did you watch your team this week? If you did, go and check out how people have rated them and go and give your own ratings. Just go and register at fanfirst.co.uk. Get registered, get rating. Really good fun over there. Thank you very much for watching. Over and out. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button to see more videos from this channel. Hit the subscribe button and to be notified every time we upload. Ring the bell for those notifications to come through on your device. If you really want to support the channel and me as a content creator, I will be eternally grateful if you head over to the merch store and grab something or support over on Patreon, patreon.com slash Benjamin Bloom. Thank you for your time. Go and watch another video.